beginning live stream. I'll let you know when it's up. All right, live stream seems to be up and running. You can go ahead. Yep. PC recording done. Cloud is rolling. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Leonardo with the opening statement, please. Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing for the Committee on Parks and Recreation. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruption, please place cell phone and electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you have testimony that you wish to submit, you may do so by email, by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Mr. Chair, we are ready to begin. Chair, uh, you are me. on mute. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you now. Okay. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today before the Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation. I would like to acknowledge my fellow Council members who are present. Council member Joe Nye, Council member Holden, Moyer, Council member Diaz, Council member Wiley, Genero, Council member Brooks, Powers, uh, Council member Dinovich, Council member Borelli, and we will acknowledge uh, other council members when they are present. Good afternoon, I'm Peter Ku, Chair of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. Today's hearing will focus on the events permitting process for special events at parks and <clears throat> what the causes and benefits are to the park system, especially when it comes to the staging of very really large events. We will also examine how COVID-19 has affected that process and what the future implications are for holding events at parks. Various recreational programs, such as art shows, films, concerts, and special events have always been part of the city's park system. The majority of these events are free and sometimes, and oftentimes, I'm sorry, and oftentimes conducted by parks itself and through its many public private partners. However, some of these events are, ver are also, quote, pay for, unquote, events that include thousands of participants. They're often run by event promoters that have a permit with parks. Parks has a multifaceted process for approving these various events. For any event with more than 20 participants, a special event permit is required for a loan refundable $25 fee. For large scale events that will involve more than 500 participants or may be commercial in nature, park citywide marketing and special events office work with the event promoter and other city agencies, if necessary, to coordinate the planning of the event. For these events, parks imposes additional requirements that must be fulfilled before a final permit is issued. That is often based on the, park, on the park's concession fee schedule. Insurance and a damage bond may be required. If an event is particularly large and complex, permits from agencies, such as from the Department of Buildings or Police Department may also be required. Further, if the event, has, if the event also 
proposes to sell food or merchandise, a temporary use of the authorization, TUA, contract is required. A fee for this permit is calculated based on several factors, including the number of vendors at the event, estimated attendance, and the prices of the items being sold at the event. Once all the requirements have been met by event applicant, Park will issue a special event permit. Before COVID-19 hit the city, there was an upward trend for events occurring on Park's property with about 14,000 special events permits issued in 2017, 16,000 in 2018, and 17,000 in 2019. Due to COVID-19, 2020 officially saw a drop to about 5,000 permits issued, were close to 4,000 being issued thus far in 2021. When the pandemic fully hit the city last year in March, parks canceled all events and stopped issuing permits but eventually opened the NYC Park Special Event Request Portal and started to consider permits for applications with an expected attendance of more than 200 people for, a, for an event. Permit applicants had to complete a COVID-19 safety plan and affirmation which included physical distance requirements, face coverings, hygiene guidelines, good communication and signage for guests, reminding them to adhere to, phys to physical distance rules and ensure that the event organizer and his employees comply with requirements set up by the Department of Health. I am curious to explore what park plan is to allow more events programming. Now that mandatory social distance and mask wearing rules have all basically ended, will we see an immediate restarting of the permitting process to what it was like before COVID-19? Did COVID offer past any lessons on whether any permitting practices to change for the long term. Also, what will the rest of this year look like when it comes to events occurring and the enforcement of park rules during these events? Aside from the COVID effect, I would like to explore how we can ensure that events permitting process equitably benefits the past system and the public. Historically, there have been concerns about the size of some of these events. The amount of parkland being used for the ticketed events and the amount of revenue being generated for the event and the condition the park is left in after the event. Oftentimes, damage from large crowds trucks, vendors, and bad weather during some of these events has left sessions of the parkland unusable for extended periods of time. This has sometimes left many community members concerned that large scale and commercial events can deprive some New Yorkers of quality access to green space. I hope that this hearing results in us understanding how Parks and its partners in the park system go about approving special events when the overall causes and benefits are to the city's open space and whether there are ways we can improve the process to ensure that the events occurring in parks are accessible to all, respected to the parks, and local communities. 
I would like to welcome the administration and the advocates who have come here to testify. Thank you once again. I will now turn you over to our moderator, committee, committee counsel, Chris Sotori, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Ku. I'm Chris Sartori, Senior Counsel to the Committee on Parks and Recreation, and I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to testify, so please listen for your name to be called, as I will periodically be announcing who the following panelists will be. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use Zoom hand raise function and I will call on you in order. We'll be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. Additionally, for members of the public, we will be limiting speaking time to three minutes so that we may accommodate all who wish to speak today. Once you're called on to testify, please, list BB, please begin by stating your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Appearing today for the Department of Parks and Recreation will be Anthony Sama, Director of Citywide Special Events, Venus Mello, Deputy Director of Citywide Special Events, and Matt Jury, Director of Government Relations. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to each representative of the Parks Department. I will call on each of you individually for response, so please raise your right hands at this time. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Director Sama? I do. Thank you. De Deputy Director Mello? I do, thank you. Thank you. And Director Jury. I do. Thank you very much. And at this time, I would like to invite Director Sama to present his testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Ku, members of the Parks Committee, and other members of the Council. I'm Anthony Sama, Director of the Citywide Special Events Office at New York City Parks. I am joined virtually today by Venus Mello, our Deputy Director, and Matt Drury, our Director of Government Relations. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today about special event permitting in city parks. From birthday parties and picnics to holiday markets and music festivals, special events take, take place every day in New York City parks. Above and beyond the free and low cost programming offered to the public by our agency, our parks are also popular locations for groups and organizations looking to host special events. NYC Parks is pleased to work with event organizers to make this a reality, as we feel that activating our parks with a wide range of recreational and cultural activity helps make them more robust and dynamic public spaces for everyone to enjoy. We recognize that these special events provide tremendous added value to our park system, so we offer a simple and efficient permitting process to make sure that proposed events are appropriate and avoid negative impacts on our beloved open spaces. Though you may already be familiar, I would like to quickly outline NYC Parks' process for special event permitting. Special event permits are required for events or activities in city parks where 20 more people will be present. Though permits can be secured for anyone looking to reserve a specific area of the park. This could include events like larger family gatherings and picnics, as well as school picnics, fairs, or festivals. The permit application fee costs $25, and we ask that applicants submit their requests at least three weeks in advance of the proposed event date. This provides the agency the necessary time to properly review the request, verify the availability of the space, and consult with park staff and others to confirm that the proposed event will not cause any problematic conflicts with other events or conventional park usage. For most permit applications, the processing fee is the sole cost, 
unless the event is large enough to require additional permitting costs, such as buildings permits, generator permits, Department of Health permits, uh, or the event qualifies as a special events concession, which is administered in accordance with park rules via a separate fee schedule. Permit applications can be submitted online, or you can visit the appropriate parks borough headquarters for your selected event site to process your event permit application. Since our agency's primary responsibility is to maintain parks and open space access for New Yorkers, the agency's borough permit offices and our citywide special event staff work closely with these permittees to ensure that every special event is properly administered with appropriate resources dedicated to set up the event in a way that minimizes disruption to the park and clean up after the event and restore it to its previous condition. For larger events, we often require the applicant to provide a maintenance bond or make other similar arrangements to protect our parks and keep them in the best condition possible. Special event permits are generally not approved for federal holidays to ensure that our parks can remain available for conventional use by the general public at busy times of the year. For obvious reasons, we did implement some very significant changes to our special event protocols during the COVID-19 pandemic. In accordance with state and local guidance, Larger gatherings were prohibited during much of 2020 and early 2021, and our permit teams worked closely with the mayor's office and others to update our processes as health guidance evolved. Limits on overall attendance and limitations on amplified sound were significant restrictions, but we did everything we could to facilitate public events whenever possible, always prioritizing the health and safety of New Yorkers. We also partnered with the Department of Education to facilitate outdoor learning at parks close to schools so that students can have access to space for socially distanced education and recreation when alternative, alternative spaces were otherwise unavailable. As conditions related to COVID-19 continue to improve in New York City, we are beginning to see something of return to quote unquote normalcy. And we are seeing increased interest in the return of outdoor public events. We look forward to working with groups and organizers to allow them to host fun community events that are safe for the public. Some of these exciting upcoming events include the Macy's 4th of July fireworks and the homecoming concert as announced recently by the mayor, as well as the New York City Triathlon, Global Citizens Festival, and New York City Marathon. In conclusion, at New York City Parks, we value our role in helping facilitate diverse events and programs for local communities to enjoy across the city which maximizes New Yorkers' enjoyment of our shared open spaces. But we also understand that some New Yorkers turn to their local parks as a place of quiet and solitude. So we value the importance of preserving access to parks to be passively and quietly enjoyed as well. We feel that our approach to facilitating special events successfully seeks to strike that balance. As New York City recovers from a very dark and difficult period, we anticipate that the months ahead will offer new and exciting opportunities for New Yorkers to get out to their local parks. And we will work closely with organizers to make sure that each special event can be enjoyed safely and appropriately. Thank you for offering the opportunity for us to testify today and for our agency staff to view testimony from the public via the council hearing live stream. We would now be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Chair, oh, sorry, Chair, uh, I will now turn it over to, uh, to Chair Koo for questions. And I'd ask that each of the parks panelists please stay unmuted if possible during the Q&A period. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Samer, for your testimony. I have a, a few questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, we, uh, parks designates different categories of parks as level A, B, C, and D. for the purpose of determining fees for the proposed events occurring on the parkland. How does park determine what park properties are categorized as, as A, B, C, and D? Thank you for that question, Chair. Uh, the the um, schedule that you're referring to is our concession fee schedule, uh, which exists as part of the parks rules and regulations. Uh, that fee schedule is used when calculating fees 
uh, for any events that reach the threshold of 500 people or more or promotional or commercial in nature. Uh, as you uh, uh, described, the fee schedule breaks parks out into four levels, A, B, C, and D. Uh, these levels are determined based on uh, mainly park popularity uh, to effectively uh, attempt to, to quantify an impact uh, that events have at these locations, given their uh, tremendous usage. Uh, and for promotional commercial events, uh, potentially the number of people uh, who are exposed to marketing and commercial events at these locations. Uh, do you have any data on the number of events that were permitted for fiscal 2020 and for each of the last five fiscal or calendar years? Thank you for that question, Chair Ku. Um, I, I do not have specific data with me at the moment on uh, on the fiscal calendar on the fiscal calendar, um, nor for the past five years. Um, I do have data on uh, the calendar year of 2019 uh, and uh, what we are experiencing currently in 20 and 21. I would be happy to go through that data uh, if you have any specific questions related to that, and would be happy to uh, provide data on those other years as is requested at a later time. Okay, so you do have uh, data on fiscal 2020, right? Excuse me. So yes, how many, how, what's the number of events that have been permitted for the current year? No, for the last, for fiscal 2020 and, 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 and this year. So excuse me again, I, I, do, not have, I do not have data uh, on the fiscal calendar. The data uh, that I have is based on the calendar year overall. Okay, calendar year is fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so for the the, uh, is there any specific uh, uh, data that you would like me to review? I, I have data in front of me regarding the number of applications requested, approved, uh, and denied for uh, calendar year twenty nineteen, um, as well as what is currently in our system for the calendar year twenty twenty one. I'd be happy to review those. Okay, can you review those? Yeah, please. Yes, yeah. of course. In the calendar year 2019, uh, NYC Parks received 20,183 applications. Uh, again, this data comes from our citywide event management system, um, which is now our digital system, which houses all applications submitted via the Parks Department uh, portal, uh, which exists on the Parks website. Uh, so 20,183 is the total number of applications submitted for calendar year 2019. Of that, 16,366, that's 13, that's 16,366 applications were approved. That is an approval rate of 81.1%. Of the 20,183 applications submitted, uh, only 50 or so applications were denied. That is a 0.2% denial rate. For the current calendar year 2021, we have in our system currently 13,211 applications that have been submitted. Of the 13,211 applications, 5,613 have been approved. That's 5,613 have been approved. Uh, I, I do not have an approval rating available on that, um, only because I would make it clear that many of these applications are for months that are ahead of us. And so I think uh, describing an approval rating would be somewhat misleading based on these figures and the fact that there are still six months left of the calendar year. Uh, in terms of denials of the 13,211 that have been submitted for calendar year 2021, only 19 have been denied. As I stated, that is the data that I have available in front of me at the moment. But again, uh, if requested, we are happy to, to make further data available uh, to the council at a later time. 
Okay. So um, we are, and, uh, before I ask you uh, additional questions, I want to say we are also joined by Council Member uh, Bannon, Council Member Van Bremer, and Council Member Rivera. So you mentioned that 20,183 applications submitted, 16,366 approved, and 50 denied. So what happened to the rest of it? It doesn't add up. Yes, thank you for that question, uh, Council Member. Uh, the, um, the remaining applications uh, were moved to uh, what is deemed a withdrawal status. Um, withdrawal happens uh, when an application um, doesn't come to fruition for a variety of reasons. Um, it is possible that uh, applicants submitted multiple applications requesting multiple sites and one site was approved. Uh, and there were only, you know, in many cases, these applicants are only looking for one site. So upon receiving approval of that site, the other applications were withdrawn. Uh, it is also possible that an applicant submitted an application for a site that was unavailable. However, uh, you know, our borough directors work very closely to try to reschedule or find alternative locations when that happens. Uh, it's likely that in many of these cases, the applicant um, was not accepting or did not want to accept, excuse me, the, the other alternatives that were made available to them and just determined that they would withdraw their application request. Uh, and, in, and there were also cases where uh, application, where event applicants just determined not to host their events. Um, and uh, that could be for a variety of reasons. And uh, when we are notified of that, once again, the application is moved to withdrawal. Uh, it is very rare, as you can see, is reflected by our 2019 numbers. Um, and I would, I, I would venture that the other fiscal year data and calendar year data we have would represent similar numbers. Uh, we work very hard not to deny applications, but work with organizers and applicants to ensure that their request is accommodated uh, in, in whatever way possible. So what was the number of ticketed uh, events in parks, ticketed means pay for, right? Uh, event for each of the last five fiscal or calendar years. Uh, thank you for that question, Chair. Um, I, uh, again, do not have the exact data in front of me. Uh, I'd be happy to get you that data on exact numbers. Uh, if I were to speculate, just having been part of this citywide special events office for uh, 12 years uh, and, and uh, you know, being able to essentially count on one or two hands the number of those events that occur, um, I would venture that uh, perhaps uh, 10 or so events uh, have carried a ticket uh, uh, to access them. Um, of those 10 events, there are fewer, uh, I would venture potentially only two or three um, um, that were 100% uh, a paid ticket for access. Uh, maybe, maybe, a, maybe a few more. Excuse me. Maybe closer to five um, were were for a 100% paid ticket. Uh, even in the cases that were that were that had a ticket affiliated with them that was not 100% paid, uh, we work with organizers to strike a balance um, of a, a, a majority of tickets uh, be made available to the public. Uh, in many cases, instituting a ticket. Uh, is important for crowd control purposes. Uh, and so uh, while yes, a ticket is required to access some of these events, uh, as I said, we work with organizers to try to make as many of the tickets available to, uh, to the public for free via a lottery or other uh, ticket system. Uh, going back to the previous question that I asked, what are some reasons why a group would not host an event? Um, thank you for that question, uh, Chair Koo. Um, some of the reasons why an event, uh, well, excuse me, why a promoter or producer may not host their event or why a person may decide they don't want to pursue their application uh, consist of a few, a few things. One, um, they've determined that they just are not interested. They, perhaps they've found a site that is more appropriate for their event uh, or an indoor site in some cases. In some cases, 
applicants go to the state property, uh, like along the Hudson River uh, or uh, along the, the Brooklyn waterfront. Um, in some cases, uh, applicants, uh, the dates that applicants have requested or the location that an applicant has requested was not available. Um, and they were not interested in the alternatives that were offered to them. Um, and uh, in other cases, uh, it's possible that um, the, uh, the um, excuse me, that the con a conflict couldn't be uh, resolved. Um, and, uh, and again, we've worked with them to try to find or figure out or, or resolve those conflicts, but they were not accepting of uh, alternatives being offered to them. Okay, yeah. So can you tell us like, how is the fee that will be paid by the event promoter determined? Uh, is the fee attached to the TUA or other type of contracts? Thank you for that question, Chair Koo. Uh, the fee is determined uh, based off of the uh, concession fee schedule uh, that I referenced earlier uh, and, and you referenced in your first question as well. Uh, that is section 2-10 of Parks Rules Regulations. It is available to be viewed on the Parks website. Uh, anybody can see what those fees um, uh, equate to. Um, and uh, we work with applicants based on the event elements they are presenting at their event uh, when calculating what those fees uh, will be. In some instances uh, where there are uh, very large events taking place, uh, primarily concerts uh, over 8,000 people um, or private events over 8,000 people. Uh, there is an opportunity to negotiate pricing uh, based uh, off of uh, or separate aside from the fee schedule. Um, I will say further that negotiation of those fees is really meant to help uh, uh, recoup money for the city uh, for resources that may be expended uh, related to the event uh, operations and preparation. Going back to the previous question again, I, I just thinking. So I'm wondering if some groups cancel because they don't hear back from parks with enough time to the event. Because I heard sometimes you know you you don't give them notice um, uh, soon enough, like. Uh, before the event, so they cancel it, yeah. Uh, there may be, uh, and thank you for that question and, and raising that issue. Um, there, there may be instances uh, where uh, producers uh, have decided uh, to make alternate plans um, based on, a, a, you know, a, a perceived lack of response. Um, you know, I would be happy to work if there's a, a specific instance or constituent uh, who has experienced this issue, um, I'd be happy to work with them and work with our borough, you know, respective borough offices to uh, rectify uh, any delay in communication. Um, uh, but I, I would venture that that the the percentage of of uh, producers and promoters who cancel for that reason or withdraw their application for that reason uh, is 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 quite small. Um, and uh, you know, I will also say that our borough offices are readily available. Contact information for our borough offices is readily available on, on the parks website. And uh, we always urge uh, applicants if, if they are having trouble, con uh, you know, if they're waiting for a response to, to feel free to be proactive and, and reach out to the borough offices uh, for a response, including the citywide special events office. Okay. So is there a time, time limit the uh, parks de uh, department uh, will respond to an application. I mean, like how many days before the event? You give them how many how many days before to approve it? Uh. Thank you for that question, uh, Council Member. It, it it can it really can vary. There is I, I will not say there is a standard amount of days prior to the event where uh, uh, an approval is necessarily required from the agency. Uh, obviously, separate from our twenty one day um, uh, request. For the event to be submitted uh, prior to the event date, um, you know we work diligently um, to uh, to try to approve requests as quickly as possible. Uh, the variances in in that communication and the amount of time it takes to get to an approval um, really varies uh, depending on 
how sophisticated and complicated the event infrastructure or event elements uh, may be. Uh, for something as large as a, as a, as a global citizens festival, for example, um, you know, those, those uh, events take literally months of planning um, to, to execute. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, we are working in good faith with many of these producers, regardless of whether or not they receive their permit, uh, you know, far out from the event. Um, we are working in good faith and working towards an approval um, to, to, you know, ensure them that these events are, are prepared and, and scheduled to move forward. Okay, yeah, I, I, I just want to make sure, you know, you give the event organizer, especially the smaller ones, enough time you know, to prepare for the event. You know, if I want the whole event um, a month later, you just tell me two days before the event to approve it, then I don't have enough time to prepare for it. You know? So we don't want that to happen. Yes, thank you for pointing that out, Chair. And, and we don't either. Um, we yeah. certainly want to work diligently um, with, with every producer, regardless of size of their event, to make sure the events are happening safely and that everybody who needs to be involved um, in terms of other stakeholders and agency partners, um, and especially if there are other permits that are going to be required, um, that there's ample time to secure those permits uh, and ensure the event is happening in a, in a, in a safe and appropriate fashion. Uh, but thank yes, you. thank you. So going back to the fee schedule again, is the entire fee, entire fee pay before the event or are there different payment plans that are worked out depending on the event? So do they pay everything right from? Yes, thank you for that question, Chair Koo. Uh, yes, we, uh, within the contracts that we execute uh, for these events, there are deadlines for the payments to be made. Uh, typically payments are requested uh, fully upfront. Um, I, I can't recall any kind of uh, payment schedule, so to speak, for these events uh, that, that we've worked uh, with applicants on. Uh, typically, payment is due prior to their beginning to load in uh, for an event, meaning before they take ownership of the site, before any infrastructure uh, or, or staffing begins entering the park uh, related to that event, uh, payment is due, uh, as is the, the proper insurance requirements. Uh, and any security bond that might be required for these events as well. So uh, can you tell us what was the largest fee that was charged for a TUA for the most recent year? Uh, thank you for that question. So uh, a, a TUA, just to, to clarify, is slightly different from the special event concessions that get issued by the Citywide Special Events Office. Uh, a TUA stands for a temporary use authorization. Uh, it, it is a vending contract effectively um, to run uh, a temporary concession um, on, on parkland, meaning you know, vending uh, of any type, whether it be dry goods or food. Um, our agreements, special event agreements um, are specifically related to use and rental of the space for special events. Uh, it, is, it is possible, and in, in many cases, there, there are instances where an event would require uh, a site fee be paid for rental of the space, as well as a TUA um, to, to authorize the vending as part of that event. Um, but just to be clear, those are two separate uh, operations. A TUA is managed by the agency's revenue division. Uh, if you have more questions about that, you know, uh, we'd be happy to follow up with any questions you may have uh, related to TUAs. Um, as it pertains to citywide special events, uh, I can say that the largest contract uh, that we've executed for a special event um, uh, was uh, probably, uh, you know, at, at, in 2019 was for the Global Citizens Festival, uh, which carried a fee of $1.1 million. Oh, so sure. that's the largest fee, right? That is the largest fee, yes. 1.1 1 .1 million. Okay. Hey, uh, when is a special permit applicant uh, properly submits their application to parks? What is the typical what is the typical time? Uh, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. What is the typical timeline as to when parks when parks will reply to the applicant? Thank you for that question, Cherko. 
uh, there is typically uh, an automated response that applicants receive initially, just so that they can be, uh, uh, just so that it's confirmed that the agency has received their application. Um, from the time it gets submitted to the time uh, the office reaches out, again, may vary based on the size and scope of the event. Um, typically our citywide special events office um, when it comes to large scale events, um, will, uh, will work to contact applicants almost immediately or within a, a few short weeks of, of applying. Uh, keep in mind, many of the applications we receive for larger events um, are submitted uh, far before um, the event dates are expected. Um, just kind of to give people a, a, a further general uh, idea of our application process, Application, uh, our application system opens um, on the first Monday of the prior year uh, for the coming calendar year. Um, so we do not begin accepting applications for the following calendar year until the first Monday of the preceding year. Uh, and so that is when um, the majority of the applications do come in from our uh, annually recurring events. Um, but again, on a rolling basis, uh, we are contacting applicants for these larger events. Um, you know, I would say, you know, within within two weeks at the most, uh, perhaps maybe up to a month, if it's a, if it's something that's happening very far out um, uh, in terms of making first contact. And many of these applicants are applicants who we've also worked with year over year. They're great stewards of our parks. They're great. Uh, they're great producers and promoters. Uh, and uh, know what is expected of them. Uh, and so in many cases, those conversations and approval processes uh, are, are somewhat truncated um, because of their uh, you know, historical standing with the agency and, and our, uh, our confidence in their ability to, uh, to continue producing their events at a high level. Um, for the smaller applications that come in, our borough offices work uh, to make contact, I believe within a week or two of applications being submitted as well. Um, however, again, there may be more of a lag um, when events are submitted far in advance. Um, of course, you know, we're always, in, in the world of events, we're always working on deadlines. Um, we're always looking forward to, you know, the next month and making sure that everything is, is prepared for what's coming up next month. Um, and so there might be priorities given, obviously, to things that are happening sooner in the calendar year than later. Um, but it's always our efforts to make contact as soon as possible after an application has been submitted. Okay. So uh, how will the recent relaxation of COVID-19 restrictions affect how parks regulate events permitting? Does parks have uh, any COVID restrictions in place for the, for the proposed events? Thank you for that question, uh, Chair Koo. Uh, pursuant to the governor's recent uh, uh, announcement, um, the, the Parks Department, as many other city permitting agencies uh, are, are doing, are expecting to begin permitting our events under the same guidelines we were pre-pandemic. Uh, certainly uh, asking applicants to continue to follow CDC guidelines as it relates to any necessary social distancing or face coverings, um, however, uh, we are currently in a state where we are awaiting further guidance from the city um, on uh, the, that interpretation. Um, obviously, the, the city had executive orders in place that need to be uh, dismissed uh, in order for us to begin uh, progressing um, you know, without uh, guidance. Um, our, our expectation is that will happen shortly, um, but we have already begun working on events uh, that, uh, that we expect to happen over the next uh, six months and the rest of the remainder of this calendar year uh, that will not be mandated by the agency to employ uh, COVID parameters for the people attending. Um, obviously, we are still asking to message that people follow CDC guidelines for those who are unvaccinated, be sure they're wearing masks uh, and things of that nature. Um, but in terms of agency requirements, uh, no, there is not uh, going to be a mandate very shortly for any kind of other restrictions or parameters uh, to be put in place. 
So, but so right now you still keep the you follow the CDC rules or follow the governor's rules. So uh, the city has, and perhaps I I should defer to my colleague Matt Drury, who's a bit more uh, uh, involved with the government's workings. Um, but speaking from my experience in in, in working in the pandemic, uh, when the governor's office has made an announcement, uh, there has been uh, collaboration with City Hall on the interpretation of those announcements, um, obviously alongside the state's Department of Health and the city's Department of Health as well, um, so that we can properly interpret those guidelines and uh, act in a way that is appropriate uh, based on the city's standing uh, uh, at the time. Yeah. And also, yeah, yeah, okay. I also ask this first before you answer. Since the different neighborhoods in New York City have uh, different vaccination rates, so some are high, some are very low. Does parks envision and adding different special event requirements in different neighborhoods? Thank you for that question, uh, Chair Koo. That is not our uh, current expectation. Uh, we are intending on following the state's guidelines, I believe. And again, I am not uh, the one who is going to be interpreting uh, those those uh, those executive orders. Uh, however, it is my understanding uh, that uh, we will not be uh, regulating event size or type based on vaccination rates within neighborhoods. Okay, so Mr. Uh, Matt, did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, not particularly. I, I think Director Sama spoke to it really well. I, I think what you're referring to, you know, as regulation and we're, 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 we're tightening and, you know, you saw, I think you might recall there was a color-coded system, you know, red, yellow, uh, orange, I might be getting that, you know what I mean? But as, as in terms of the sort of, you know, standing down, uh, you know, th those sort of contemplations are, are not so much uh, quite a part of the picture any longer. Okay. So, so uh, Mr. Sam, Sam I, uh, how common is it for unpermitted events to occur? And what is the enforcement practice that is implemented when one is taking place? Thank you for that question, Chair Koo. Uh, it, it is not very common uh, that events happen unpermitted uh, in our parks. Uh, we take pride in, in being a, a fair and equitable process uh, and give everybody the opportunity to use our space. Uh, in times where there may be an unpermitted event, we find that it happens because perhaps the applicant was just unaware of the process. Uh, so we always take the route of educating uh, people on what the, pro the proper practices are um, in, in, to ensure that uh, you know, proper protocols and, and, and uh, application processes are followed. Um, we go so far if we uh, see something being announced on social media, uh, to even reach out to those applicants. If we know an application has not been submitted to say, you know, we are aware that you, you would like to use our parks, please, you know, work with us to, to properly secure a permit for your event. And in many cases, people are, are more than happy to do so. Uh, they're apologetic and they understand that there is a process that must be followed. Uh, in cases where events happen unpermitted, uh, you know, or we are expecting an event to happen unpermitted, we uh, have close coordination with our parks enforcement patrol uh, to be on site at potentially problematic unpermitted events um, to, again, provide education should the event be moving forward and, and happen uh, and, uh, and ensure that uh, if the event does continue, it's happening in a way that is not um, terribly impactful to the park space and the surrounding usage. Okay, so... So can you tell us, uh, do you have any data on the number of unpermitted events taking place uh, in any recent year? Um, I do not have data on that. And um, frankly, I do not believe parks tracks, uh, at least not in the special events office, we do not track data on unpermitted events. Um, I think it would be somewhat uh, unrepresentative 
um, because we obviously will only hear about the large permitted events, unpermitted events that are happening, right? Uh, there are, I'm sure, are many people who use our parks uh, and do not get permits to do so and may have more than 20 people at their events. But those are, again, very small gatherings. They're not impactful to the park. In most cases, you know, our park staff or enforcement are on, if they're on site and they notice it, they may just say, hey, you know, this is what the process is, but they'll let them continue. Um, and it's not really tracked in, in a real way. Certainly the larger events that are unpermitted, um, you know, we do hear about, uh, but again, I, they're not tracked um, in, a, uh, in a qualitative way. So you are saying that like, uh, if a pet officer uh, asks uh, some, like a group of 20 people barbecuing in the park, if they don't have permit, uh, the, uh, the officer will just let them continue. Yes, there might be a case. It, it depends on the type of event they're having. And that there might be a case where someone else who is a permit holder comes to utilize the space, um, in which case a, a park worker or a park uh, enforcement officer will approach the group and, and help to uh, resolve any conflict. Um, you know, most of these conflicts are resolved by the people themselves. And again, most people understand uh, our system. And so when presented with a permit, they will, you know, move to an alternate location and continue their event. Um, but I, I don't want to speak to parks enforcement practices, but it's my understanding is it's, it's always our goal uh, to educate, not, not enforce or write summonses. That, that is not our first recourse here. Uh, it, it is to ensure that people understand what the process is uh, and are enjoying our parks safely. So they don't give them a ticket or, uh, or ask them to pay a fee. If they don't have a, if they didn't apply, you know, can they apply like uh, uh, afterwards? So um, uh, again, I, I don't wanna speak to parks enforcement practices. I, I, I do not have data on rates of, of, of summonses and things like that. I know that they, they do, again, try to educate people first. Uh, rather than go right to writing a summons. Um, I will say when there are large events that are happening uh, unpermitted, we have taken uh, efforts and written formal violations uh, to those producers and organizers. Uh, and uh, you know, so there is uh, some record of uh, that applicant acting outside of the proper protocols. Uh, and in extreme cases, uh, there might be a situation where Parks takes uh, extra um, uh, action uh, and uh, prohibits that applicant from getting permits uh, in the future for a period of time. Okay, so does the park department, park department keep track of it or uh, keep track of event promoters that have some sort of negative history? Yes, thank you for so that question. How, how, we do. Yeah. Um, uh, we have regular with our borough directors and their staff. Um, and so when there are problematic promoters, and I want to be clear, this is not a rampant issue that we deal with. Uh, you know, many, if, if not, you know, most uh, of our applicants and, and event producers are, are uh, upstanding users of our parks and, and want to follow the rules and are, are generally apologetic if something happens out of, uh, out of order uh, or out of order. Uh, uh, process. But in the cases where we do have a bad actor or are witnessing bad behavior uh, in, a, in, a, in a more consistent way, uh, we will uh, communicate with our borough staff that if applications uh, come in from this particular applicant, uh, they should be flagged because that applicant has uh, presumably received violations in the past and is, uh, is not um, uh, allowed to to secure a permit uh, for for a period. So so they are, if a promoter has a negative history, you will stop issuing permits to them. Or, that is correct for, for a period of time or what? For a period of time, Parks has the ability to uh, basically put applicants on probation uh, for a period of up to two years. Um, again, that's up to two years. Uh, I 
again, cannot remember a situation where we've uh, put an applicant on probation for that long a period. Uh, we have experienced cases where applicants were denied um, permits because of a violation history, um, but it, it happens very infrequently. Um, and, uh, and again, is, is communicated to our borough staff when necessary. Okay. So how do Parks Department and NYPD determine the security needs uh, for a certain event, how often are pet officers or park rangers assigned to work at an uh, event? Thank you for that question, Chair Koo. Uh, as a matter of practice, each year, uh, the, the citywide special events office will meet with our uh, parks enforcement officers, uh, the assistant commissioner uh, of, of the parks enforcement patrol, uh, as well as inspectors uh, to relay the calendar of events for the year, uh, the, the calendar of large scale events for the year. Uh, our Parks Enforcement Patrol does have a special event detail uh, seasonally that they employ and send out to these large events, uh, primarily to serve as public safety officers uh, and uh, stand by in the case of any emergency. Uh, uh, but they are not there, I wanna make it clear, they are not there to uh, police the event, so to speak, or to employ security for the event purposes. They are there uh, as, again, uh, in the case of an emergency uh, and, and for public safety purposes. Uh, and so they do try to attend as many of the large scale events uh, as, as they can. Um, uh, certainly uh, the larger parades, uh, larger concerts and festivals that happen throughout the city, uh, they are typically on site uh, uh, to, to have some oversight on. Um, in terms of NYPD, uh, you know, again, we work very closely with uh, NYPD operations and with local precincts, community affairs officers to ensure that uh, uh, if additional uh, security is, is needed at an event, uh, you know, certainly the larger scale events are, are where um, NYPD's uh, expertise is, is, is requested, um, and uh, they will determine, um, you know, within their agency what is appropriate uh, in terms of a detail, if necessary, for those events. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Santori, are there any members of the, uh, on our committee who want to ask questions? At this point, I will uh, ask any members. Uh, we'll, we will potentially call on other members to ask their questions in the order they have raised, use the Zoom or raise hand functions. Council members, if any of you would like to ask any questions of the Parks Department, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. And I'd ask that all of you please keep your questions to five minutes. Uh, the Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and we'll let you know once your time is up. Um, uh, you should begin once the Sergeant has announced you and given the cue to begin. And at this point, I, I do see Council Member Dinowitz has raised his hand for a question. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, I'll be quick, five minutes, uh, two main questions. First, I just wanna say how excited I am that our parks are reopening as we come out of this pandemic. You know, the parks were the place where we all went to enjoy time with our friends, time with our families. Um, in your opening statement, um, Director, you said you want to avoid negative impacts on our beloved spaces. These spaces that so many of us, so many of us went to during this pandemic and I hope we continue to utilize after. Larger, you said larger events have bonds to facilitate, help facilitate cleanup. I, I'm, I'm, you know, with in a, in a short amount of time, one, how do you, how, and you use these words larger and smaller a number of times. I'm one wondering, one, how you define larger events uh, and for these events, I guess, festivals or concerts, I'm assuming, but is there a number of people who ends up paying for the cleanup? Um, and is there an impact on things like the soil in the grass and the grass, a sprinkler system? Who ends up, uh, pay, bears the cost of that sort of cleanup and impact on our parks? Uh, thank you for that question, council member. Uh, we are, let me, share, let me just first say we share in our excitement 
so uh, thank you for that. Um, we there's a lot to unpack there. So let me start by saying smaller and larger events. The 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 defining mark is the 500 number typically. Um, you know, events over that 500 number uh, are 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 deemed to require more uh, administrative uh, oversight, uh, insurance obligations. Um, but that said, there are events that are smaller than 500 that also uh, may need to provide those types of elements as well, insurance or bonds. Um, it, we typically make that determination based on what the event encompasses, what type of infrastructure is coming in, um, how many people they, they realistically expect. Um, and you know, again, the impact it's gonna have to the site. Um, are we talking about an event that everybody's going to have the opportunity to, to engage in and and uh, and pass through? Or are we talking about something that's a little more restrictive for one reason or another? Um, and so, you know, those are the, the things we take into account to determine um, if a bond is appropriate. Um, but once a bond is deemed appropriate, uh, it is the applicant's responsibility to to maintain the site during their event um, and restore the site after their event whether that's related to trash cleanup uh, or restoration of damage that may have been caused pursuant to their event. Uh, you know, there is impact to our landscapes. There is impact to our parks when these events happen. We work with larger events to ensure they actually don't happen and don't have infrastructure as much as possible uh, on our soft surfaces to mitigate those types of issues. Um, we, we defer and move a lot of our larger events that want that kind of infrastructure to hardscape areas, whether it's uh, asphalt pads, uh, you know, paved areas, um, uh, you know, uh, larger plazas. Uh, I, don't mean like to, I don't mean to be rude, running out of Go time, Go ahead. but it's long to read. It's uh, the, the, the permit applicant's responsibility for, large, for events, okay. And that includes impact on the park itself, not just garbage. Okay. Yes. The other thing is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, so many of our families um, took to the parks for birthday parties because we had to, right? And they're great places to have them. And it's, I'm not sure we're going to have time for an answer, but um, a number of families or people, I don't know if it's families, people here in the Bronx, we want people to use the parks but we found a lot of people here in the Bronx, especially at some of the smaller sites that may not get as much attention, like small corners of Van Cortland Park, Mashaloo Parkland, are having gatherings, I won't use the word large because they're not 500 or more, of larger than 20 people. Um, permits are not uh, being requested. Um, and though we want community engagement, we're getting a lot of complaints of noise, mm -hmm. people leaving garbage, and you spoke great about educating education efforts. Um, I would just like to share that I, uh, I haven't seen a lot of those education efforts take place here in the Bronx because we were getting repeated complaints uh, about areas. It sounds like those education efforts get um, take place in the parks that always get the most attention like Central Park. Mm -hmm. But we have park space here in the Bronx too where we want families to use, but we don't want them abused because there are families who live around the parks as well. So I would just ask that you include those education efforts and that enforcement, both in terms of the way that the, the park is treated um, and the fine. hours in which the park is used here in the Bronx. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Sorry. Please, no, yeah. Um, please go ahead. No, just really quickly, uh, Council Member, because we appreciate the question very much and just want to you know, clarify you know, first and foremost, our, both our borough commissioner and, and uh, you know, uh, obviously here centrally, we're always happy to talk about, you know, if we think there are specific recurring uh, concerns or issues, uh, because this, it sounds to me as if the scale of what we're talking about here probably doesn't qu fall quite so much under Anthony and his citywide special events team, but more on sort of the smaller, you know, significant still, but not necessarily mega events of that nature. So, you know, whether it's birthday gatherings or other sort of, you know, informal sort of gatherings that can leave a real impact for sure, whether it's trash afterwards or, or noise or what have you, you know, that we certainly do have a, a PEP, a parks enforcement uh, contingent for the Bronx. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, you know, they're dedicated to getting out there and making sure they're, you know, again, education is our first approach. 
uh, you know, if, and, you know, we're happy to kind of talk you through more, you know, how that deployment works and it's a challenge for sure. So the, the, the long and the short of it is we'd like to work with you and your office to help get out there and educate the public about the importance of keeping our shared spaces clean. You know, enforcement is obviously one important tool, but I think there's just a broader message that we all, you know, sort of share these spaces and we all, you know, especially in light of COVID and, you know, how, how valuable these spaces have come to be, you know, I think we all need to sort of share in that responsibility broadly, but, you know, but the agency certainly, uh, values its importance in our parks enforcement uh, folks are, are first and foremost on the front lines, getting out there, you know, educating, enforcing where necessary, uh, you know, but we want to work with you in your office to, you know, kind of make sure we're getting the word out uh, about keeping our parks in their best condition possible. Thank you. And I, I do want to highlight that this, this is a very important issue. You know, we're not having tons of concerts in the Bronx. Our issue, you know, a lot of issues here is we want our park spaces to be utilized the right way. I want to be able to use it with my family. I want all of our neighbors here in the Northwest Bronx to use it. Um, and, and they are gatherings of larger, of more than 20 people. Uh, and these are gatherings, um, when done right, that are impactful positively to our community. But again, the complaints that my office is getting about these larger than 20 people gatherings, which would otherwise, according to you, require a permit lasting later to the night and having that impact that we don't want our larger events to do. We, all, we also don't want these smaller events to have that impact on the, on, the, uh, on the parks, on our community, whether it's noise, whether it's leaving garbage or whether it's uh, coals from a barbecue mm -hmm. being dumped and left there. So these are, again, here in the North Bronx, these are issues that are of great import. So I, I thank you for your attention to that and, and look forward to speaking with you both more about that and with Parks Department more about that. Thank you, council member. Thank you, council member. And seeing no other committee members with any questions, I will turn it back over to Chair Ku for any additional final questions. Okay, yeah. So, uh, Mr. Sama. Oh, before I ask questions, uh, I want to announce that uh, we are also joined by council member Orwich. Mr. Samuel, I want to ask you a question about the upcoming big concert uh, launched for August uh, on the Great Lawn. And can you tell us um, what is the preparation process for now, as well as uh, any fees being charged to the organizers? Thank you for that question, Chair Koo. Uh, we are uh, working diligently with uh, the organizers of that event uh, to uh, plan and prepare uh, for the event on the 21st. Um, the event details are still coming into focus, um, but you know we have engaged our agency partners uh, and other stakeholders uh, to ensure that uh, proper processes are followed, uh, that the, the park and the Great Lawn uh, operate uh, seamlessly uh, and are able to accommodate this event um, with you know minimal impact to uh, the re remaining park users uh, who rely on Central Park for their recreation, so uh, we are we are regularly uh, meeting uh, and uh, and going through those planning processes uh, related to your question uh, that has, to my knowledge, not been negotiated yet uh, in terms of the fee for this event, uh, but we can certainly get back to you once those. Uh, uh, arrangements uh, have been negotiated uh, as a follow-up. Okay, so you will communicate with us, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in the guidelines for large-scale events, DPR states that it tries to ensure that at least 80% of event tickets must be provided free of charge to the public uh, for events taking place in a certain location, such as the Great Lawn. So, uh, are you doing that uh, for this event? Yes, and, and thank you for that question, Chair. That That is the plan, yes. 80% uh, of the tickets for this event uh, will be, uh, will be uh, offered free uh, to the public. Uh, it is not yet determined um, in what capacity that will take, how that, that will work, that distribution. Um, again, these, these details are coming into focus, um, but a, a ticketing plan will be submitted 
to parks uh, for approval. Uh, and it is our expectation that yes, uh, that 80% that figure to, uh, for the public uh, access uh, free of charge will be, will be uh, part of the plan. Okay. Um, so in what other specific park locations uh, does this 80% uh, uh, policy apply? You apply to everywhere or? Um, well, thank you for that question, council member. We, we, the 80% is, is uh, right now something we institute on the Great Lawn uh, uh, primarily. Um, it is, uh, it doesn't, I wouldn't say there are too many other sites that employ a split. Um, you know, thinking about uh, the other sites where we do have ticketed events, Randall's Island primarily is one of them. Um, many of those events are 100% uh, ticketed. Um, that's the, 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 the lion's share of ticketed events that, that we do in parks uh, is on Randall's Island um, uh, or on, I should say on public space uh, is on Randall's Island. Um, and uh, the other sites where events have historically happened um, employ a, uh, you know, we start with, you know, an 80-20, that's what we strive for, but we always work to ensure that the majority of the tickets, uh, over 50%, are, are, are free, distributed, distributed free of charge. How much revenue uh, was earned by past department for issuing of TUAs and special event permits for events uh, during the most recent year? Uh, so the data that I have, uh, once again, is on the uh, 2019 calendar year. Uh, okay. We collected uh, special event site fees uh, in the amount of uh, 3599000 one hundred and ten dollars, uh, and we collected TUA fees uh, for vending in the amount of one hundred and twenty-eight thousand one hundred and eighty-eight dollars. Okay. So, can you tell me, uh, to, uh, tell the committee, uh, your process for selecting uh, what events will take place? Uh, can you tell us the what factors are considered in determining? the location, the size, the content of the event? Uh, thank you for that question, Chair Koo. Uh, in, in many cases, uh, it, it is the applicant that, that makes the request for a specific location and size of their event. And then parks will work with that applicant to determine the sites that are most appropriate to accommodate those details. Uh, when it comes to processing applications and who gets permits and who doesn't, uh, parks, uh, processes our applications on a first come first serve basis. Uh, and so, as I mentioned earlier, there is a, a, a permitting period that exists and begins on the first Monday of November in the year prior. Uh, our returning applicants, uh, meaning applicants who, uh, you know, obviously host their events annually um, uh, and intend to use the same space on the same weekend uh, with the same details of their, of their event are uh, given first right of, of refusal um, on their recurring date, so long as they apply within the first month of that period. Uh, so if, if, if you host an annual fundraising walk uh, in uh, Riverside Park, then, uh, then you will uh, be entitled to that date each year as long as you apply within the first month of our permitting period. Anything received after that first month, uh, December, starting December 1st, uh, is processed on a first come, first serve basis. Okay, so, so can you tell us the, the most common reasons that past department has typically denied applications uh, to host events? And how many in instances in the last year uh, the department has prematurely closed an event. Uh, thank you for that question. So um, looking back to our calendar year uh, 2019 data, again, uh, we denied approximately uh, 50 events. Uh, the reasons for denial are few uh, and actually written into 
uh, parks rules and regulations as well. Uh, the reasons why the agency would deny an event uh, would be because an event is deemed inappropriate use of parkland uh, that can take a, a variety of, of shapes and sizes. Uh, there's also a reason uh, of a conflict existing within a space. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if a conflict does exist, uh, we work very hard to, uh, to work with applicants to ensure that uh, they are accommodated in some other way. Um, but uh, there are applicants who uh, are very intent on hosting their events on that day at that park. Uh, and um, in some cases, believe it or not, will require that the, or, or request that the agency deny their application pursuant to our rules. And so we will do so. Uh, and then finally, we will also deny applications as I alluded to earlier, if it's an applicant who has, uh, has uh, historical uh, bad behavior on record or had multiple violations uh, pursuant to events that they've hosted on Parkland previously. So after the event has concluded, So yeah, I was interrupted by a phone, yeah. So let me uh, repeat the question again. So after a event has concluded, uh, does your department uh, do a review process? See whether this event is successful or not, or whether you will do it again next year or in the future? Yes, and, and thank you for that question. Uh, we uh, have very close communication with our um, special events staff uh, citywide, as well as operations staff, uh, who tend to be the ones on site at these events uh, and who uh, report any issues that they might see uh, or situations where sites are left uh, in uh, poor condition uh, due to an event. Uh, and uh, if that is the case, then you know we will work with applicants to rectify those situations uh, to ensure they do not happen. Uh, the following year. Uh, if necessary, we will, we will invoice those applicants to cover the costs associated with parks having to clean up or restore the site, uh, uh, but assuming that they pay for those reparations and, uh, and are, are open to working with us to develop a plan to ensure that the event uh, does not uh, uh, take place in that fashion again, uh, they are welcome to return. Uh, and as I said, uh, you know, our applicants, it's in their best interest to, to act in accordance with our rules and regulations because they do rely on us to, to you know, provide this space for their recreational and event purposes. Uh, the same way we rely on them to program uh, our parks in a, in a vibrant and dynamic way. So uh, it, it's mutually beneficial that, that we work together to ensure those types of issues don't happen on a recurring basis. Uh, so do you have a staff actually uh, attending all these events and, and after work they write a report on this? Well, thank you for that, uh, that question, uh, Chair. We, uh, my office, the citywide special events office does not necessarily attend every event uh, that happens in the city. Uh, and I'm sure you can appreciate based on the numbers I've shared, yeah. uh, it, it would be impossible for us to do so. But that said, we do have park staff almost always in parks where events are taking place, whether or not they're staff dedicated to the site, or perhaps it's a, it's a manager who's, uh, who's you know, moving around the borough to check on the event schedule that weekend, popping in and, and, and checking on each park in their district. Uh, and if they do come across an issue, uh, yes, they will write. They will write up, uh, 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 typically it's, it's not as formal as a report. Uh, typically it would be uh, an email to the, the, the director of special events for the borough or to myself. Uh, you know, we ask our, our operations staff to always uh, take pictures of any issues that they may encounter uh, and properly document those, those uh, issues uh, so that we have a, a record of, of applicants who have behaved badly and can properly communicate with them 
to uh, to resolve any any issues. Okay. Uh, I just want to say we are also joined by Council Member Cabrera. Um, so, do any conservancies or alliances have the power to hold events and determine the content of the event without uh, parks uh, input? Well, thank you for that that question, Chair. Uh, I will say we work very closely uh, with our conservancies, uh, alliances, friends of groups, uh, civic groups that are affiliated with our parks to ensure that events are happening to the standards that we all expect. Uh, uh, regardless of our conservancy or alliances uh, um, agreement with the Parks Department, final approval for events uh, always comes from NYC Parks. Permits are always issued by NYC Parks. And so we, we maintain close communication on events scheduled uh, at their locations, at their parks. Um, with regard to the events that they themselves are hosting and programming, uh, you know, again, they are required to submit applications for those events. Uh, there is uh, collaboration and communication on what they are planning uh, and, uh, and they always do require the approval of parks uh, 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 via a permit uh, in order to take place. Okay. So can you tell us uh, what are the bond or insurance requirements uh, for events that are given approval? Like how much they had to buy insurance? What, what are the bonds? Oh, thank you for that question, Chair Koo. Uh, a security bond uh, is generally uh, somewhere between $250 uh, and $1,000, depending on the size and scope of the event. Uh, that is held as collateral in case of any damage uh, or additional uh, uh, fees are incurred uh, related to you know, reimbursement required uh, for an event. Um, with regard to insurance, uh, and I will say bonds are, can be substantially larger for the larger events uh, taking place. Um, a bond for an event on the Great Lawn, for example, is $100,000. Uh, okay. so, so the larger events that are happening in our parks, you can rest assured are, are you know, putting up a security deposit uh, that they wish to get back. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so you know, again, it's, it's, it's in all of our best interests to ensure that we're there, we're keeping the best standards uh, and practices for our park space when it comes to events. Uh, as it pertains to insurance, um, events are required to get a minimum of a 2 million general liability uh, policy for their events. Uh, and then depending on the details of the event may also be required to submit automobile liability insurance, uh, as well as proof of uh, workers' compensation and disability benefits uh, to ensure that any workers related uh, to the, uh, the build and, 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 and who would be working the event are covered under the state's uh, law. Okay. So uh, do all event contracts require the promoter to repair the grass or other damage that results from the event? Uh, thank you for that question, Chair Koo. And yes, uh, our contracts with our larger events all require that uh, it is the licensee or permittee's responsibility to return the site and restore the site uh, uh, upon completion of the event. So, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, I can interrupt you again. Okay. Um, so, so the, the, the promoter is required to repair, right? And or they, they can, are they doing it themselves or they hire parties to do it? Thank you for that question. Uh, they, pursuant to our agreements, they have the ability to utilize vendors of their own if they wish, but those vendors that are selected to do any kind of restoration or repair would need to be approved by the parks department prior to such work taking place. So 
you know, they, they would need to run any, you know, a, any vendor they wish to use by our agency to ensure the work that would be done would, uh, would meet the proper standards and requirements pursuant to city and uh, law and, uh, and agency standards. So, so they cannot ask you guys to do it. Say, hey, I don't have staff to do it. Uh, I pay you to do it. Can you do it for them? Uh, it, it would depend, it would depend. I, I, I assume, you know, I presume it would depend on what they're asking us to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a small organization asking us to assist with, with cleanup for their event, it might be as simple as saying, just make sure you're bagging your garbage, place it by the, or in the receptacles and, and we will take care of that for you. Uh, for events that, that are larger and expect to generate a substantial amount of garbage, no, parks will not provide those types of resources and will work with events on reviewing their trash plan to ensure they have, uh, at least on paper, presented us with a plan that represents proper staffing uh, and proper carding services if necessary uh, for, for trash generated during their events. Uh, by permit, it is, it is the, the, the applicants and permittees responsibility actually to also remove any generated trash from the event from the site. Uh, and so, you know, we, we also work with applicants to review those plans and make sure they're doing so. Again, unless it's a small event that parks uh, is, is able uh, and willing to, to remove trash from. So does uh, past department get the funding? Uh, the value, if there are damages, uh, that require making an insurance claim or from bonds. Suppose there's some damages and then insurance pay you money. Uh, yeah, thank you the, for that question. Yeah. Um, typically the way we would handle any restoration or damage that would be need to be repaired uh, is that uh, the agency would, uh, if we're, well, a few things. If we are the ones who are going to hire a vendor or do the repairs ourselves, then we would uh, prepare an invoice for the applicant, which they would have to then pay in full uh, and then would receive their bond back once they've paid for the damages to be covered. So to be clear, the bond that we collect is, is not, uh, it, in practice, is not deposited and utilized unless damages that have been invoiced for are not paid in full. Uh, it, those, those checks are, are held as collateral. Uh, and then we work with the organization to pay for the repairs that need to be done. Uh, and they pay for those repairs. Uh, and then the, the bond is returned to them. Uh, in terms of how insurance comes into play in that, uh, to my, I, I do not know, quite frankly, and I'm not uh, involved directly in the claim that an organization would make to their insurer to cover uh, damage or uh, or restoration from their event. Uh, well, I'm interested to know that like, when they pay you a payment, does it go to the department directly or go to the general fund? If they are paying for restoration or repairs uh, stemming from their event that have been uh, that have been done by the agency or done by a vendor of the agencies, then that money comes to the, the department to cover that those costs, whether it's overtime or materials, whatever, whatever stemming from the cost, they that, that money would stay within the agency. If they okay. are paying a, or, or they'll be paying a vendor directly um, that we've approved to do the work, in which case we obviously would not receive uh, money from those repairs. Okay. So can you tell us uh, the, the security requirements? Uh, uh, um, what kind of security requirements are placed on the promoters? Do they have to hire their own security guards or, or they use uh, uh, MI, uh, PD or they use pet officers and do they have to pay for it? Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Chair Koo. Uh, it is the responsibility of the promoter 
an event producer to provide security related to their event operations. Uh, any any complement uh, of of security staffing that Parks Enforcement or NYPD uh, puts towards an event is solely in a public safety uh, uh, public safety condition. They are not there to provide security for event purposes, uh, meaning that if uh, an event has, for example, uh, a ticket related to the event for access, it is event security that checks those tickets. It is event security that maintains order amongst the crowds and queues waiting to enter an event. It is event security, private security, who oversees uh, any event related equipment uh, and ensures uh, that the event uh, infrastructure is protected. Uh, NYPD and Parks Enforcement's involvement in events is again, merely to provide public safety and additional support in cases of emergencies. So who, who's paying for the extra uh, um, NYPD or, or other security? The, the promoter, right? Thank you for that question, Chair Koo. Uh, in many cases, uh, yes, the promoter is the one who is covering those costs. And those costs are, are part of the resources that are uh, reimbursed through the very large site fees, uh, you know, for the Great Lawn, $1.1 million. Uh, you know, uh, a sizable portion of that is, uh, is used to help cover the city's resources that go into uh, ensuring these events are happening safely. So uh, can you tell us the what factors determine whether the past department uh, has to shut down an event and how often this happened in the past for uh, in the past for large uh, for large events has it ever happened that you shut down an event to to my knowledge uh, I have never heard of an event a permanent event uh, being shut down uh, there are cases where events need to be evacuated due to an emergency or a weather related reason. Uh, and certainly that has happened. Uh, and, uh, but to my knowledge, no permanent event has ever needed to be shut down for a reason related to uh, a permittee or promoter's behavior at the event. No. Does your department uh, play any role in determining what the admission cost uh, will be for ticketed events? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, while, <clears throat> excuse me, while we do request uh, information uh, related to the ticket plan, which includes uh, pricing for ticket levels for those events, uh, the department does not, uh, does not, uh, influence what those ticket costs could be. That is uh, up to the promoter to determine. Uh, and in many cases is uh, industry standard for, uh, for you know, large festivals uh, that take place nationwide. Now, let me pause for a minute. Uh, Mrs. Centauri, do we have any members uh, want to ask questions? No, Councilmember, there are no, currently no members with additional questions. Okay, so I will continue with a few more questions. Does DPR include any reporting requirements on the part of the promoter as a condition of being issued a special event permit or TUA uh, for promoters of large scale events? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, uh, I'm not sure which reporting specifically uh, you might be referring to. We, we do require uh, lots of documentation ahead of time uh, in order to approve events, uh, you know, such as uh, site plans, uh, production schedules related to load in, runs of show, load out. Uh, obviously, we require 
administrative documentation such as payments and insurance up front. Um, you know, we may also, again, we require things like ticket plans, um, any plans related to uh, concessions that will be on site, sponsor activations on site. Uh, you know, the Parks Department approves all details surrounding and related to uh, the events that take place on our property. Uh, so, you know, there is reporting from the promoters done on what the events will entail. Um, in some cases, there's also reporting in real time done uh, related to how many people are attending the event. Uh, again, pursuant to, to our contracts with uh, especially the, the, the much larger concerts and events uh, that, are, that have a ticket associated with them. Um, we request real time reporting uh, on how many people are inside the venue at any given time. Uh, and so that is reporting that's done. Uh, post event, uh, I am not, you know, the city does within our, our agreements reserve the right to audit uh, and, and things along those lines. Um, but in terms of, of formal reporting, uh, post event, uh, no, there is nothing that's, that's, that's necessarily required. Uh, we may have debriefings, uh, meetings to discuss, you know, the good and the bad. Uh, and especially for recurring events, you figure out how to rectify any issues that may have occurred for future years. Um, but uh, that's, you know, like I said, those are um, meetings that would happen post event. Uh, there's no formal reporting that's required or done uh, uh, on the part of the, the permittee. Thank you. So does DP, uh, does um, past department allocate more of its employees to work and be present during uh, uh, approved events? Do you assign some more workers or, because it's a big event? Uh, yes, and thank you for that question. Uh, when it comes to certain events, uh, the citywide special events office will have staff assigned to be on site uh, at some of these events. Um, primarily, you know, the larger, the larger concerts and larger festivals. Uh, there is special event staff in, in some locations uh, that are also uh, designated, you know, to be on site within their respective parks uh, to, to cover and review uh, large events that might be taking place. Uh, generally speaking, citywide, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it is the operations staff uh, as part of their regular role uh, uh, to, you know, review and pop into events that may be happening uh, within their districts or within their parks. Uh, so that's that would be part of their regular shift and regular responsibility. So can you tell us now how is the maximum number of participants determined and who ensures that the maximum number is not exceeded during an event? Well, thank you for that question, uh, council member. Uh, when an applicant makes a request for a site uh, on the application, they have to specify how many people they expect. Uh, in many cases, applications uh, will reflect an overall number for an event. Uh, that is not necessarily a number that will be there at any one time. Uh, that is a number of people that may attend the event over the course of the event's term. Uh, typically, you know, for between four and six hours. Uh, we work closely and our borough directors work closely with applicants, uh, given their in, you know, institutional knowledge uh, of the sites and working closely with the park managers and regional managers who oversee the operations within these sites uh, to ensure that we are not putting anything in there that would stretch the limits of what the site can hold. In cases where there are ticketed events, uh, obviously those events have a perimeter uh, that, that surrounds them. Uh, obviously for any of the free events that we host, our parks are ambiguous spaces. And so uh, it is, you know, th there is not really a mathematical equation that is used to deem what site, what a site, particular site can host um, because it's, it's borderless. Um, but when it comes to our ticketed events, uh, and any events that are enclosed or in an enclosed space by temporary fencing um, or perhaps within uh, 
let's say an MPPA site that has a fence around it naturally, uh, then those events are required to get uh, a Department of Buildings temporary place of assembly permit. And those permits uh, designate a capacity, a maximum capacity for the space. And it is the promoters and organizers responsibility to enforce that capacity, um, which is again, why for some of those events, for most of those events, we require reporting on how many people are in the space uh, to ensure that that capacity is not exceeded. And in many cases, we do not allow promoters to ticket beyond what the capacity of a space is to ensure that safety. Uh, so uh, for an event like exists on the Great Lawn, for example, uh, you know, they will have a TPA that designates 60,000 people fit within this space based on the size of the venue. And they are not allowed to distribute more than 60,000 tickets to ensure that even if everybody who gets a ticket decides to come to the event, uh, we will not exceed capacity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Sama. Uh, Mr. Satori, do we have members on the committee who want to ask questions? At this time, Chair, no, there are no additional questions from other committee members. Okay, then, then I'm done with the questions. Can we like, uh, go to public participation? Yes, Chair, uh, we'll now move on to public participation and thank you to the Parks Department. Uh, I wanna thank the council for uh, giving me the opportunity to testify today. Uh, Parks will have representatives who stay on uh, for the public testimony portion of, uh, uh, of the, the, the hearing. Uh, however, myself uh, and uh, the others on the panel will uh, need to, uh, to leave the, the, the meeting at this point. Um, but there are other representatives who are listening in and uh, Chair Ku, uh, we will be sure to follow up with you uh, on any other items uh, that are outstanding from today's hearing. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. your participation. Yeah. Thank you very much. At this point, we'll now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. As I stated earlier, each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once a sergeant at arms has started the timer and given you the cue to begin. Uh, council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. Again, for panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. So please wait for your cue. At this point, we will hear from Heather Lubov of the City Parks Foundation, who will be followed by J Joe Paleo of Local 983. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Heather Lubov. I'm the Executive Director of City Parks Foundation. We are a nonprofit that leads free sports, arts, environmental education, and community building programs that encourage 300,000 New Yorkers to use and care for their neighborhood parks and green spaces every year. As a programmer, we apply for hundreds of permits each year. And let me say right up front, although I know they've left, um, Director Sema and Deputy Director Melo are wonderful. And the entire team handling permits is incredibly conscientious and they do everything they can to accommodate our requests, which are many. Uh, for Summer Stage in Central Park, we offer 45 or more free performances each year our license agreement with the Parks Department sets limits on the number of events that can be closed to the public or ticketed. And when we do rent the venue for either private or paid ticketed events, that money is used to directly subsidize our free concerts. This arrangement helps make our free summer stage shows possible and we're enormously grateful to the agency for allowing us to maintain these funds. Typically festivals of our size and stature book their concerts at least a year in advance. So we're already talking now with artists for the summer of 2022. While we do get right of first refusal, as you heard, on dates that we've used in the previous year, the current permitting system won't allow for initial permit approval on new dates until January of each year, which is at least six months after we start booking shows. So we're taking risks every time we confirm an artist before the permit process catches up 
which makes it difficult to remain competitive in the marketplace, whether for our free performances or performances planned by our for-profit promoter partners who have ticket sales at stake. And we've already lost several shows next year because we weren't able to confirm some of those dates. As the co-manager of Partnerships for Parks, we work with hundreds of volunteer community groups each year to plan service days, community events, and other activities in parks. Let me stress how important it will be to fully fund both maintenance staff and the parks enforcement officers in this year's budget, because again, as you heard, they are essential to the success of the many events held by our volunteer groups. What's more, many of these events were previously funded by member designated grants through the Parks Equity Initiative, which puts funding straight into parks and communities. So I hope the council will restore funding to that important initiative. Many of these volunteer groups are not incorporated and the cost of insurance when required can be prohibitive. But more concerning is that if a group is holding an event in a park and a member of the public gets hurt in the park and decides to sue the city, those individual volunteers who were in the park that day for an event whether or not they had anything to do with the patron's accident can be held personally liable because they're not backed up by an incorporated organization. New York City Parks is very careful to facilitate public-private relationships and really takes care of its partners. So if the city's goal is to encourage community engagement and support for parks, which I think is critical, there are a number of challenges that if addressed could create a much more positive and encouraging environment for volunteers and nonprofits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joe Paleo of Local 983, who will be followed by Jessica Saab of New Yorkers for Parks. Time starts now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Ku. I appreciate the time for, for me to speak on behalf of the local. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Joe Puglio. I represent the parks enforcement officers, the urban park rangers. I represent the associate park service workers and all the city seasonal aides. I, um, I commend you uh, uh, in restarting our park special events, uh, but I just have some serious concerns. Um, uh, although the parks department does its best to keep these events moving, uh, as best as they can. We simply do not have the workforce that is necessary uh, to keep um, the parks under control. For example, we have the uh, 4th of July coming up uh, in, you know, uh, soon. Do we have the capability uh, when it comes to enforcement and maintenance to keep uh, these events in check? Most people do not take out permits for the 4th of July. And a lot of these events consist of 20 or more people multiple groups in, in one small in one small area. These become problematic. Uh, a lot of people do not uh, understand that they cannot barbecue, uh, even though it's the 4th of July in these specific locations. Uh, we had a reduction in staff. We have 130 people that we lost the last budget. You know, uh, So we're gonna be at a deficit to what we were uh, in 2019. And we already had a difficult task uh, prior to that. We need to restore those numbers immediately. Uh, there's, uh, I heard some of the uh, council people talk about what could you do? We could restore the budget, restore the 130 people that we lost last year. For the first time in 20 years, we lost 50 Rangers that had to actually be laid off. That hasn't been one since that time. So we urged the city council to restore and add, add additions too because of what's happening now, you're gonna see a surge in park usage. People have been cooped up. People wanna to go to the parks. People wanna enjoy. People wanna make sure that they're safe in the parks. So I thank you all. I uh, appreciate all the uh, others that have joined in like uh, with the partnership of parks and uh, hopefully we'll have a safe uh, park season this year. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Palero. Yes. I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, uh, we heard that uh, there are only 17 uh, pet officers yes. for the entire borough of Brooklyn. Yeah, what happens so, when a lot of people don't, I'm sorry. Uh, what happens is that during the summer months, a lot of the resources from parks goes to the beaches and pools. So what you actually have is a reduction in staff that's already minimal. So everybody's basically uh, covering the beaches and the pools, which leaves boroughs like Brooklyn, like you said, 17 people, 17 people to facilitate all of the parks in Brooklyn. 
uh, is 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 ridiculous, you know. So we need we need people. We 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 need to hire them, and we need to hire them quickly. Um, Mr. Cook. So so, how do you cover uh, uh, when when we have a special event? You know, you only have seventeen yeah, that, officers for the whole board, uh, so it will create a, a great big impact on you. Yeah, it, it is, and uh, and and these uh, dedicated people do the best that they can, but unfortunately, the odds are stacked against them. It is an impossible task that you're asking them to do. A lot of them work extended hours. They switch their work schedules, which they're not supposed to do by law. By the way, uh, we're we're dealing with a grievance on that issue. Uh, we need to hire more. We need to have more funding for overtime. There's, there's no money there for overtime either. I hear that they get these uh, revenues uh, from, from the, the permit holders. Uh, that money should be used to pay for their overtime when needed. Uh, that's, that's the only way I can see this thing uh, working out uh, properly is, is more staffing. The 130 people that we lost have to be put back in. Uh, in, in, in order in order for us to uh, get things as close to normal as we can. And I appreciate all your efforts, by the way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Pilaro. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica Saab of New Yorkers for Parks, who will be followed by Carlos Castell Croak of the New York League of Conservation Voters. Time starts now. Good afternoon, my name is Jessica Saab and I am the Advocacy and Communications Project Manager at New Yorkers for Parks. We want to thank the City Council for its strong commitment to restoring essential parks workers positions in the preliminary budget response this year and thank Chair Ku for hosting this hearing and inviting us to speak. The Council's commitment to supporting the badly needed staffing levels for city park workers, PEP officers, and urban park rangers is essential to helping our park system rebound. Over the last year, our city's parks became the safest and at some points, the only places to gather in community. New York City communities have a rich history of volunteering in their parks, and this year that was stronger than ever. We work with grassroots volunteer groups every day who take care of their parks in different ways, from cleaning them, to planting them, to programming them. However, during a season with devastating budget cuts, it remained difficult and unnecessarily complicated for volunteer groups to do their work. Principle among the issues is that of indemnification. The city indemnifies many of the groups that volunteer through the It's My Park program, but does not indemnify many other grassroots organizations that care for parks citywide. This forces groups to get their own insurance, a burden too large and expensive, causing many of these groups to give up, the exact opposite of what New York City needs right now. In addition, there is often confusion due to each borough having a different permitting process. This should all be streamlined, made easier for the citizens that are volunteering their time, especially now as parks have played such a significant role in our lives. I also want to take this opportunity to talk about two related budget items we hope the council will restore. We urge leaders to restore $4 million to the parks equity initi initiative, which gives funds directly to over 600 small volunteer groups and is a critical lifeline for many small parks throughout the city with dedicated volunteers hoping to make essential improvements. 800 million must also be restored to maintain our city's natural areas and wetlands, as well as adequately fund Green Thumb and our city's community gardens. The New York City Parks Department is always asked to do more with less. It is urgent to restore the full budget to ensure parks are safe, clean, and accessible to all New Yorkers, whether part of a small volunteer group hoping to put on events for their communities or everyday New Yorkers who are just enjoying being outdoors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carlos Castel Croak of New York League of Co Conservation Voters, who will be followed by Sarah Charla Powers of the Natural Areas Conservancy. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castel Croak, and I am the Associate for New York City Programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City. And we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I'd like to thank Chair Ku and the council members on the committee for the opportunity to testify today. NYLCV supports a fiscal year 22 city budget that bolsters our an equitable permitting process and protects our parks overall. 
Our city is on the road to recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, and it is incumbent upon our elected leaders to invest our tax dollars in climate action solutions that protect our people and public spaces. Parks and other green spaces are one of the city's most valuable environmental assets and are a major source of the city's urban canopy, which mitigates climate change, provides clean air and habitats for native wildlife, and contributes to the well-being of our residents and economy. Preserving these spaces is a top priority for NYLCB. But over the past year, through the hardships of the pandemic, we have seen the cleanliness and safety of our parks drop significantly due to unfair budgetary cuts to staffing and programs, which also impacts access to parks for people most in need. Therefore, in this critical third year of the Play for campaign, we are thankful that the council has voiced support for our plea to restore 78.9 million in the FY22 parks budget to ensure our parks are safe, clean, and accessible. From our platform, I would like to specifically highlight the $4 million for the parks equity initiative, the $9 million for PEP and urban park rangers, and the $8 million for nature and resiliency that are all absolutely critical for park safety and operations. COVID-19 crisis is still placing stress on our economy and communities. This was apparent in the FY21 budget, but does not need to be the case again this year, now that the federal government has provided relief. We urge the mayor and city council to have foresight and prepare for the climate crisis by making permanent commitments to environmental investments and to parks. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank so you. you oh, so you, I have a question for you. So you're saying you need $4 million for a past equity initiative, right? Yes, that's what we're asking for. And and what what's the rest of the numbers? I, I, I missed it. I'm well, sorry, it was, so specifically what, we, what I wanted to highlight um, is $9 million for PEP and urban park rangers and $8 million for nature and, and resiliency. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah, Sarah Charlotte Powers from the Natural Areas Conservancy, who will be followed by Catherine Heinz of the of NYC Audubon Society. Time starts now. Uh, Ms. Powers, could you pause for one second? I think uh, we just need a second to unmute you. Give us one second, please. Uh, Ms. Powers, can you try to unmute yourself, uh, perhaps? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, okay. Yes, thank you. Please begin. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Helen Forgione. I am reading testimony submitted by Sarah Charlotte Powers, the Executive Director of the Natural Areas Conservancy. Um, thank you, uh, Council Chair Ku, and the committee for the opportunity to testify today. The Natural Areas Conservancy is a nonprofit organization that was formed in 2012 with the goal of increasing the capacity of New York City Parks and its partners to restore and manage the 10,000 acres of forests and wetlands under the agency jurisdiction. I am testifying today to implore the Parks Committee to act to ensure that next year's budget include funding for the care of natural areas, spaces that have been critically important to New Yorkers during the pandemic. A signature project of our organization was the development of the Forest Management Framework for New York City, which we released in partnership with New York City Parks in spring 2018. This plan includes ecological and social metrics for the care of the city's natural forests and calls for an investment of 385 million to manage them over the next 25 years. We were thrilled in 2019 by the leadership of the city council and mayor which resulted in 43 million of expense funding for New York City parks, including 4 million to support the management of 7,300 acres of forested natural areas. This funding was used to implement the first year of recommendations for the forest management framework. New York City parks was incredibly efficient with these funds. They employed 47 seasonal staff 
planted 20,000 new trees and shrubs, engaged 2,000 volunteers, improved 40 miles of trails, and cared for 900 acres of parkland. The plight of our city's natural areas has mirrored that of the full park system over the past year. Visitation to natural areas increased 65% between 2019 and 2020. At the same time, the Parks Department's ability to care for the one third of parks property that is natural areas has been drastically impacted due to budget cuts and the loss of more than 50 seasonal staff. Another significant challenge is the impacts of the hiring freeze, which has left key leadership positions empty for more than a year and resulted in an incalculable loss of institutional knowledge. Today, I stand with my trusted colleagues and friends in strong support of Playfair, calling for the full reinstatement of funds that were cut from the agency's budget last year. It is imperative that next year's budget include 4.5 million to continue conserving and caring for our natural force and begin critical improvements for our city's wetlands and trails next network. Thank you again for your leadership and for the opportunity to express our support for increased investment in New York City Park. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Catherine Heinz of NYC Audubon Society, who will be followed by Roxanne, Roxanne Delgado of the Friends of Pelham Parkway. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Ku, and thank you, committee members, for sharing your commitment to a healthy and green New York City. My name is Catherine Heinz, and I am the Executive Director of New York City Audubon. We are a science-based conservation organization whose mission is to protect the 350 plus bird species, almost a third of all the species in North America, amounting to millions of individual birds that live in or pass through New York City each year. Some 40% of the Atlantic Flyways bird species are species of conservation need, some threatened and some even endangered. Protecting these birds and their habitats improves the health and quality of life for all New Yorkers, as all humans benefit from clean air, clean water, and clean green space. And yes, this includes forever wild areas and buffers that are critically important to safeguard. Millions of birds, like our millions of city dwellers, depend upon New York City parks maintaining and protecting our urban parks and natural areas to survive and thrive. These birds fly for thousands of miles each spring and fall before nest resting here temporarily feeding on native plants and insects. Wintering waterfowl depend upon clean waterways and wetlands. Summer residents forage here to feed and fledge their young in our city's parks. And coastal nesters reply, rely upon clean, undisturbed and invasive predator-free beaches. During these challenging times of COVID-19, more New Yorkers than ever are flocking to our parks and beaches. New York City parks continue to be our shared refuge but increased use warrants greater care and maintenance. Engagement, supervision, and fair, equitable, and adequate enforcement by PEP and urban park rangers are also essential to safe, clean, and welcoming green spaces for birds and for people. Large unplanned and unpermitted gatherings that leave excess garbage, hot charcoal, dogs roaming off leash in natural areas, firecrackers, ATVs, off-road bikes, and even human feet trampling where they don't belong cause real and lasting damage. We stand proudly with New Yorkers for Parks and the Natural Areas Conservancy in demanding adequate funding for New York City Parks expense budget. Please restore essential funds for PEP, urban park rangers, and horticultural and maintenance staff. Please also restore the Parks Equity Initiative, which helps small groups like ours host inclusive events and programs for our communities. And please, please, please restore the $8 million for nature and resiliency in this year's Playfair platform to support green thumb gardens, forests, trails, and wetlands. Our city's health depends upon it. Thank you for this opportunity to advocate on behalf of our membership and millions of birds. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Roxanne Delgado of the Friend of Friends of Pelham Parkway, who will be followed by Lucy Sexton of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. Time starts now. Okay, thank you, Chair, for analyzing the costs and benefits of special events on our open green spaces and the local community surrounding those spaces. I would like to argue 
that I actually think the cost outweighs the benefits of these special events. And based on the number provided by the director of special events, 4.5 million, I think the cost of these events definitely outweighs the, the financial gain. And some of these costs cannot be measured. And I like to argue, just this weekend, we had groups doing illegal barbecue on Pelham Parkway, but there was no uh, pep office available. They were all diverted to special events citywide and to the beach nearby. So we had groups burning up our trees, trees that provide us with the share, um, shaded open uh, clean air, as well as habitat for birds migrating to Pelham Parkway to the Botanical Gardens. And these costs are not measured. So not only um, like considered costs that may, uh, outweighs the benefits of these open spaces, but there's costs indirectly in other green spaces that are not being measured. So I think that when they do special events, they should not only measure the enjoyment of those who are attending those events, but also the negative impact for all living beings that require that use that open space and other green spaces throughout the uh, park agencies that, that manages those spaces. I also like to say, I think um, elected, newly elected Dinowitz council member for mentioning those unpermitted uh, events. Because Pelham Parkway, there's no special event allowed in Pelham Parkway because it's a greenway. Yet we have many groups, over 10 to 20 groups holding parties in Pelham Parkway that generate over 500 to 600 gallons of trash every weekend. And parks does not have the maintenance to, to clean up. We don't get regular maintenance because we are a green space, a greenway, but yet it's used as a park. And the PEP officers, when they're available, they don't enforce the rules. They don't enforce the illegal barbecue. And they don't enforce big, massive bouncy houses on the parkway. I mean, this is um, either give us the maintenance and enforcement if you're going to treat Palm Parkway as a park or enforce the rules. You can't have it both ways. Again, I'd like to thank the chair for his uh, advocacy for our green space. I really do appreciate it. It may sound like I do complain, but I do appreciate everything you've done for our green spaces. And yes, we need money for more park enforcement. We, we have misuse of our parks and when we don't have any enforcement, it just not only continues the misuse, but it encourages other people to abuse our parks. And what's sad is that we do a lot of efforts to keep our parkway clean, but a few groups, a few people on, um, does so much damage, on, does our work for the whole year. It takes one person to, uh, to create so much damage on our parkway. So I thank you for your time and please play fair for parks. I hope that we get parks get the adequate um, funding to care for all our green spaces for all living beings. So have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lucy Sexton of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, who will be followed by Stacy Papas of the Friends of the East River Esplanade. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Ku and members of the City Council. My name is Lucy Sexton. I'm with the Cultural Advocacy Coalition, New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, whose membership includes arts and culture groups and art workers from across the five boroughs. I want to address the use of parks for cultural events by nonprofit cultural groups and independent artists. The city's parks are one of its treasures, and we, of course, want access to those treasures to be democratic and available to all the city's communities. So I'll address some of the barriers experienced by nonprofit cultural groups, particularly groups and artists without deep pockets. First, I want to thank and recognize the hard work of the personnel follow at hard work and personal follow up done by the Parks Department staff dealing with permits. Once a group has engaged and applied, there's responsive support by the department and it's great and ongoing relationships are built. However, getting to that stage is not always easy. In the lead up to the council's passage of open culture, which allowed permitting for specific streets across the city, the Department of Cultural Affairs put together an info session on city permitting processes. Four or five different agencies presented and that is part of the problem. It is not at all clear how to navigate the permitting process since you first need to know the correct agency. Is this a city park, a state park, a community garden, a DOT plaza? Parks should find a way to message the processes clearly and make sure the information is reaching every community. I would go so far as to ask that the parks include permitting information in their signage in each park. That would go a long way to making it accessible to the hip hop dance group in the Bronx who might want to permit a park space for a performance but has no previous experience or relationship. Second, there are financial barriers. While the permit for free events is affordable, the fees jump astronomically if the group wants to find a way to charge for the event or even pass the hat. I propose that the Parks Department look at the system set up for open culture, where the event must be available and free to the public, 
but a group is able to charge their audience either in advance online or to post a Venmo address for donations or to pass the hat. So there's no blockage of, or of visibility or passage for the public as is necessary for our community public spaces, but there are avenues for arts groups to bring in income to pay their artists and costs. Finally, the open culture program also has a hardship waiver for insurance. Here again, it would be great for the parks department to follow suit and make performing in the parks democratic and accessible by all the city's communities and cultural groups. In this way, New York City can fill its parks with the culture our communities are craving. We can allow hard hit arts groups to generate the income they definitely need. And we can set the standard for the world on how to heal, recover and thrive with arts and culture for every citizen in every park. Thank you so much for all your work and thank you for letting me testify. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Stacy Pappas of the Friends of East River Esplanade, who will be followed by Eileen Miles, who is our last registered speaker. Time starts now. Thank you, everyone. Um, Stacy Pappas, Executive Director of Friends of the East River Esplanade. We are a small nonprofit that hosts events in our park of about 500 people or less. So a lot of what we have to deal with is not quite on the large scale of summer stage or 60,000 people in a park, but we still have to go through the same process of permitting. It is cumbersome. It is um, the wait time is really problematic. Um, I wanna thank everybody for the support they've given. I've been in a lot of these meetings and listening to all the questions that Chairman Koo has asked today, he's obviously listening to what everybody has been saying. So that's really encouraging and I thank you for that. Um, the event permitting process is easy to submit until one receives three pages of safety protocols that are not up to date with listed COVID safety protocols. As of 616, I submitted a permit for, for 100 event and I got a three page safety protocol Meanwhile, the state has been listed, has been lifted. Um, Yankee Stadium is filled with 15,000 people. Madison Square Garden is filled with 15,000 people with no safety protocols in place. Um, it takes parks an inconsistent number of days or weeks to approve a permit, leaving organizations in limbo during the review process. Um, as Chairman Koo pointed out earlier, the length of time spent waiting for approval has caused my organization to cancel events and withdraw permits for events as small as 20 people or as large as 100 it's because the online status for the submit, submitted permit simply states under review. Um, there's no indication of a good faith effort to approve or reason for the length of review time. Um, in addition, sound permits are obtained through NYPD and not until a week before the event, at which time parks can deny or contradict the sound permit that's what, that was issued by NYPD. The permitting process for volunteer activities is the same. It takes 30 days for approval and because of short staffing, submitted permits are often forgotten, requiring multiple rounds of follow-up by the organizer. Volunteer activities require lead time to allow for sign up or weather driven and seasonal and require material support from parks. Alternatively, there's no opportunity to create a last minute project to address a pressing need like weeding or litter pickup. Volunteering is an activity encouraged by parks, but it's prohibitive to organize based on the permitting process. Um, please incorporate supportive staffing measures so that communities can actively enjoy and care for the parks that they love. Streamline the permitting process, make it easier for people to get their approvals in the time that they need in order to get the organizations um, time to plan to get their vendors secured and to get them the word out that an event is happening that they want people to come and enjoy it, especially now that things are opening up people are act are actively seeking events we've gotten plenty of emails and calls about when we're going to start doing things again so we need this process to be quicker um, and more streamlined. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Eileen Miles. <clears throat> Time starts now. Great, hi. Um, I wanna thank the city council and the parks and recreation committee for having this meeting. Um, I'm speaking as an individual, but also as a part of a group called East River Park Action. Um, I've been a resident of the East Village for more than 40 years, and a writer, a poet, and an educator. Um, I follow the completely undemocratic process of the planned closure utter destruction of East River Park. There's a shortage of parks in the city, and especially in low income and neighborhoods that are predominantly people of color. The NYCHA housing across the street from East River Park has been kept in the dark about the real process of the Esker project. They are endlessly cited as who Esker is for, 
but their voices, except for tenant leaders whose voices are easily leveraged by public servants who support Esker, are nowhere to be heard. Um, NYCHA, the NYCHA residents have submitted thousands of petitions against this plan. They have marched and recently are going to the polls. Those of us who care about our neighborhood, who have been asking for an oversight meeting on this plan, rather than ramming it through, Esker is a ghost of the departing administration. Heat is the number one killer in New York City, yet the city council is allowing the removal of 1,000 trees next to FDR. Um, what we're looking at is a real danger to this in terms of air quality, heat, and the mental and physical well-being provided by green space. Also, Eastboro Park is the home of 120 different species of birds. There's so much natural disaster in the impending destruction of this park. Also, as a New Yorker, I know a three or four year project as projected by the city is a 10 year project and it is already over budget. And, it, and this project is potentially being given to a construction company Hello, you're picking out. Uh, Ms. Miles, are you still on the call? You seem to have broken up. It appears we have lost her at this point. Give us one second, please. Hello? Hello? Yeah, I think I actually oh. finished my statement. I had finished my statement. Thank you. Um, it, okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Are there more, any more participants? At this point, Chair, there do not appear to be. I will just make one last call for anyone. If we had missed anyone inadvertently who had registered to testify and has not yet been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and you'll be called in the order that your hand has been raised. I see one there. Oh, Josephine. I see one person, yes. Uh, Josephine Scalia, please uh, please begin once the sergeant has uh, given you the cue. Time starts now. You're still muted. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Josephine Scalia, and I am a board member of the Forest Park Trust. Thank you for supporting and restoring Park's budget and for the opportunity to testify about the importance of New York City forests. I ask the Parks Committee to ensure that next year's budget includes funding for the care of natural areas, which is so important to the well-being of New Yorkers. The Forest Park Trust is a nonprofit organization founded in 1997. We work with partnerships in New York, with New York City Parks and the Forest and Highland Park Administration in its effort to manage, care for, and secure funding for programs and park improvements. In 2019, Forest and Highland Park benefited from the City Council's $4 million, which funded the Natural Areas and the Forestry Management Framework FMF plan. An FMF study was actually conducted by the Natural Areas Conservancy in Forest Park and found that 64% of our patrons used our natural areas. But they also found that our forest health scale was tipping due to less native and tree rate regeneration, especially oak species in the mid and understory. Can you imagine Forest Park without its towering trees and its large cradling canopy? 
The parks greatly benefited from the Playfair program. We hired seasonal staff that removed trash, invasive plants, maintained trails, reforested sections, and provided a consistent presence within the forest interiors. This targeted aid improved the vigor of our natural areas, park safety, and contributed to our patrons' physical and mental health. However, during the pandemic, parks suffered from drastic budget cuts, which resulted in poor park conditions. Although we did receive a grant from the Green Relief uh, Grant, uh, the trust did receive a Green Relief Grant to keep seasonal staff, we witnessed higher trail usage and an increase in brush fires, dumping, and graffiti, conditions that we haven't seen in decades. We hope that the City Council will restore the $8 million for the nature and resiliency in this year's Playfair platform to support Green Thumb Gardens, forest trails, and wetlands. Please help us to continue to protect, protect, preserve, and care for these areas by restoring the funding. It will ensure our parks will be safer, cleaner, healthier, and more accessible. Thank you again for your leadership and commitment to New York City Parks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And at um, I, I do see Council Member Holden does have a question. Uh, yes, I just want to say hi to Josephine and thank you for your testimony. Uh, on behalf of the Forest Park Trust, they're a great organization. And uh, it seems like we're fighting a losing battle many times in our parks, but thank, thank uh, heavens for the Forest Park Trust. Thank and, you. And, and I thank just you. echo, you know, parks never receives the funding that, that it deserves, obviously, and the chair had said that earlier. Um, but uh, it's, it's great, you know, we have so many volunteer groups within our parks and Forest Park is no exception. Uh, we have the Friends of Forest Park, we have the, like I, like I said, the Forest Park Trust, but it's such a large park with um, wonderful trees. And you're right, the trees need uh, a good investment to preserve, even the memorial trees that were from World War I need some tender loving care and, or they, they won't survive much longer. Um, so I, I thank you, Josephine, again, I can't thank you enough for staying on this uh, at hearing so long mm -hmm. and um, for your testimony, because it, it, it will go a long way and it, it is being heard. So thank, thank you. you. And thank we you. thank you, Councilman Holden, for your wonderful support at Forest Park. Uh, I really love made it. A difference. Again, you don't have to go far to go to the forest because you have Forest Park. You don't have to go upstate, folks, because Forest Park, mm -hmm. uh, you can see what Queens used to look like by just hiking the trails at Forest Park. So, again, thank you for your advocacy, Josephine, again. It's thank you, Chair Ku. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you. And at this point, I will turn it back to Chair Ku to offer any closing remarks and to adjourn the hearing. Thank you. So I want to thank the Department of Parks and all the advocates who testified today. As our parks permitting process restarts and events begin, I hope that the city will remember the impact that all events have on our parks, both good and bad, and ensure that we have the necessary resources and appropriate policies to ensure that our parks continue to not only be cultural and event hubs, but they remain safe, clean, and enjoyable for all visitors. Uh, finally, I want to thank the committee staff and my chief of staff, Elaine, and of course our moderator uh, for helping um, this uh, committee, uh, this uh, public hearing, uh, to be successful. Um, this meeting has been adjourned.